Press Club Brussels Europe and the Korea Press Foundation under the theme of climate change and the role of news media. This event is held in conjunction to the 2021 P4G Seoul Summit, which is taking place on May 30th to the 31st. The forum is a virtual event with speakers connecting in from Korea, Europe, and Africa. KPF and Arirang Television English Channel is providing live stream of this forum, and the participants here at the conference hall are adhering to the quarantine guidelines. I would like to now invite Kim sung jae head of the Korea Press Foundation Media Headquarters, for his opening remarks. Good afternoon, ladies and gentlemen. My name is Kim sung jae the head of the media headquarters of the KPF. I'd like to extend my gratitude to Vice President Brussels Europe for co-organizing uh, today's event. I'd like to also thank the founder of the Press Club, uh, Maria Laura Franciosi, and Lauren Brihe, uh, Director General. I'd like to also uh, thank today's speakers, Professor Raman Pacheco Pardo and Professor Yun Sun Jin of Korea. I'd like to also thank all the panelists from Korea, Europe, and Africa. And also, uh, thank all the viewers uh, who are joining us online. From the 30th uh, this month, the P4G summit meeting will be held in Seoul. In order to tackle a global climate crisis, the governments, corporations, and civil groups uh, come together on the occasion of the P4G summit. And we, Seoul is hosting this event for the first time. In commemoration of the P4G Seoul summit, the KPF and the PCB are co-hosting today's event. In the morning of Korea time, we had the uh, KPF, uh, EWC, uh, forum, uh, following uh, the forum, I believe we are going to have a fruitful discussion among Korean, uh, European, uh, and African journalists on the theme of climate uh, action and the role of this media. I'd like to uh, again thank all the viewers who are joining us online on YouTube. The KPF will continue to create forums for discussion uh, to discuss major issues in this society. Thank you very much. Yes, I would like to invite Mr. David Ad Lago, Vice President of the Board of Directors of Press Club Brussels Europe. Much. I assume that's uh, for me to talk. Um, I just have a short intro. Um, as Vice President of the Brussels Press Club, obviously we're very, very proud uh, to be also welcome you to this event. Um, whether climate whether you're a climate change denier or a skeptic or agnostic, you know, it's obviously one of the major, major political issues. Uh, as a journalist, and there are several of us at the Press Club who come in every day, it's something we write about every single day. Um, we journalists, um, we're preparing um, next month, well, in July, actually, to cover a massive package of uh, probably a thousand pages of uh, proposals on climate change, energy, um, and moving forward to a climate neutral Europe. Um, so once again, as I don't have much time, but as, as uh, Vice President of the Brussels Press Club, I'm, I'm very proud uh, you know, that we're a co-organizer today with our Korean friends. Um, I'd just like to say that we, we also organized last November, we also organized a pandemic proof uh, 24 hours. It was a marathon of online press conferences devoted to the climate issues. So I'll, I'll end, um, you know, I, I just have three minutes um, by wishing you a very fruitful debate this morning. Thank you. 
We will now begin today's forum. I would like to invite Seyung Kim, reporter of JTBC. He will serve as the MC for the forum, and he is meteorology and reporter of JTBC and reporter for the weather segment of the JTBC newsroom. She received, received her PhD in atmospheric science from Yonsei University. Hello, I am Kim Seyung, as was introduced. Today's forum will invite presenters from Korea, Europe, and six speakers from Korea, Holland, Denmark, Kenya, and Rwanda for the panel discussion. Our presenter for Korea is Dr. Yoon Shin Jin, professor of grad the Graduate School of Environmental Studies at SNU. She is currently serving as the president of the Sustainable Society Division of the Presidential Commission on Policy Planning. She received her PhD in Energy and Environment Policy at the University of Delamere. Our presenter from Europe is Dr. Ramo Pacheco Pardo, associate professor in International Studies of King's College London. is also serving as the KFBUB Korea Chair at the Virgin University at Brussels. And as the first panel list is Yoon Jiro of Sege Ilbo. She was awarded the Korea Green and Climate Award at the National Assembly Forum on Climate Change and earned her Master's in Atmospheric Science from SNU. From Holland, we have environmental journalist Frank Straver, who served as an editor at the News Energy Energy. He graduated from the School of Journalism of Utrecht University. Next is Deputy Director Lee Bum, Sung Bum of Na Nature and Wildlife Unit, KBS. He'll join us from Korea. Deputy Director Lee is producing environmental special series and also participated in the production process for Wild Map Season 2, a wilderness exploration documentary. From Denmark, we have Mr. Klaus Thiemann, a freelance journalist, as a panelist. He is running Project Pressure, an open source digital platform that visualizes the threats of climate change, which has made appearance on major news outlets such as BBC, CNN, and NPR. From Kenya, we have Mr. Eugene Anakwe, the CEO of KM Lookup Media. CEO Anakwe is the founder and the manager of Kenya's TV47, Lookup TV, and Lookup Radio, who also reports on climate change and environment-related issues. Last but not least, we have journalist Bernard Na Namta of Nation Media Group, who will be joining us for the panel discussion from Rwanda. Journalist Namta is the branch manager for the East African and Rwanda Today, while making appearances on RBA, a Rwandan talk show. Now, we will begin our presentation and discussion under the theme of climate change and the role of news media with our two presenters and six panelists. The allotted time for the discussion and the presentation is 90 minutes, so I would like to ask all of you to be mindful of your time limit. I will, I'll, I will give you a signal if you are going over your time limit. I would like to now invite Professor Yoon Sun Jin of SNU on the topic of climate change and the role of the media. Good afternoon. Hello, everyone. I am Yoon Sun Jin, as was introduced. I majored in environmental energy. But today I would like to talk about how the media is covering climate-related issue, and I have conducted various relevant research on that topic, which is why I believe I was invited to talk today. Today I would like to talk about how we should respond, respond to the climate crisis and what the role of the media should be. And I would like to share my relevant research results and my thoughts with all of you today. The media plays and assumes a very pivotal role, as we are all very well aware, because when it comes to environmental issues, they are matters that require expert knowledge. And the environment is a very important matter and a very important societal issue which needs to be publicized and which also seeks much solutions. And environmental issues are ones that require definition of concepts and creation of public opinion. So it also affects uh, policy acceptance as well. It explains policy and also exposes problems behind policy, which is why I believe the media plays as a medium between experts and the citizens. Having said that, when we make news coverages, 
We cannot cover every single problem and every single issue. As I, there is the selection and exclusion process in play. Some events are magnified while others are watered down, and some are not even covered at all, which is what I mean by exclusion. So, if certain issues are excluded, as I uh, depicted in the square, there are then the reported articles, but they are also reported under the concept of framing. So whichever event or incident it may be, the media plays as a medium, and it is delivered under a frame. And like I said, um, these coverages influences public consciousness about social problems, it creates public opinion, and it influences the public's understanding, and it also influences their social acceptance and policy acceptance. While conducting research on climate change, I conducted an analysis of what it was called a comparative policy network media report, and I tried to look into how countries um, reported climate change differently. What I felt from that research is that Korea is not very pessimistic about climate change, so I asked myself why that is the case. In the year 2009, at, at EU, email hacking was, became a very controversial issue, whereas that was not the case in Korea. So when it comes to the issue of climate change, Korea is perhaps not a opinion leader, or it is. it may be because Korea uh, highly depends on scientific facts. So I also conducted a research on journalists' perceptions towards um, climate change issues. Well, that particular article was written in Korea. At any rate, I was I interviewed 31 journalists back then, and I asked them what they think their role was as a journalist, and what they think their role should be in covering issues like climate change. And these are um, their responses. Journalists often deal with controversial issues. What should be their role when dealing with controversial issues? They should be publicizing the social issues, and they should be providing scientific evidence based on data, and they should be communicating facts to the public. What is very interesting here is that um, they should walk away from national interest, and they should report from an international perspective, and they should also be aware of issues on a global scale, and they should be able to encourage the public to pay attention to planet issues and to cause changes in the public's perception and behavior. Then how is the Korean media covering climate change and what is the image of the public? Climate change is mostly relevant information that's recently acquired through the media in Korea, which is why KEI, a national institute called KEI conducts a national environmental consciousness survey every year. It is a research that looks into the image of the public towards climate change. So these are the ranks of the respondents. Oftentimes, they think that climate change is a damage caused by abnormal climate and that it leads to average temperature and that it is related to greenhouse gas emissions increase and that it is also related to sea level rise. 
뭐라 그럴까 증 증후 이런 것들에 대해서 더 많은 이미지를 가지고 있고 이것이 so often times their images focus on climate symptoms, but less they are less aware of how climate affects their daily lives or how it affects ecology as a whole. Then where do they get their information on climate change and how sufficient do they feel the information is? A highly number of respondents said that they feel that the information they have is very insufficient and that they won't have a demand for information, further information. And whereas in the past, TV was the main source of information, recently internet portals are the main main gate through which they are acquiring information on climate change. So with the culture of digitalization spreading, these are the changes that are being witnessed. And in Korea, when it comes to climate change, what kind of terms are used in the media? There is global warming, climate change, climate crisis, so on and so forth. In 2019, Guardian made a suggestion to use terms such as climate crisis, emergency, and breakdown instead of climate change. Ever since such a suggestion was made by Guardian, the term climate change is used more frequently. So ever since 2009, the terms have changed. Uh, oftentimes, media in Korea is divided into either conservative or progressive. Uh, what is quite interesting here is that Joseon or Jungang, the conservative newspaper do not use the term environmental crisis that much in their editorials, whereas progressive news media outlets um, have a higher frequency use of the term climate crisis. And the number of articles on climate change are increasing. Last year, we had a very long wet season, which is what there was much coverage on the issue of climate change. And like I said, I conducted an editorial analysis of the major editorials of Korea's major newspapers. And the progressive newspapers, and especially the Gyeongyang Daily newspaper, covered this topic quite a bit, whereas the conservative news outlets covered climate change related editorials less. And when covering the topic of climate change, what do newspapers usually deal with? So far, there has been much coverage and articles written on climate change, which is why I looked into the rainy season of 2020. We had frequent typhoons last year as well, which is why I looked into the first, the period covering the from the first day of the rainy season all the way to September 2020. That was my search period. And I conducted a media report research, and the most frequently reported type was phenomenon. And there was there was some policy solutions and suggestions as well, but there is very low coverage on what citizens should do regarding climate change. So this is in line with what I had stated previously about citizens' perceptions. And what you see here is what I'm still, is still an ongoing research about which article has many comments. The number of articles and comments is not entirely proportional from what I have um, reviewed so far. Some articles have many comments written underneath, whereas others are not. 
There are more comments on policy and damage and phenomenon. And a lot of the people who write the comments often criticize the current government with very harsh language. So, can the media play a positive role in describing a positive image of climate change? This is um, what you see here was a joint research by Sege Daily and Sumang Women's University. And it was a research on mapping the risks associated with climate crisis response. And there was an article written on this research result, which I saw as very significant. When it comes to climate crisis, the Korean society should be very aware of the prevalence of fake news. Oftentimes, news is fabricated in Korea. One representative fake news has to do with the case of the Spiegel article. It wrote that Germany needs to speed up in dealing with the climate change issue. Germany's constitutional court made a ruling recently, and the federal government's carbon emissions goal was upgraded. And one media news wrote that that was the result of a failure caused by a nuclear phase out. Now, what you see here is somebody I knew held an interview. I know this person and this person's perceptions and thoughts, but this particular article wrote content that was quite different from what he usually says. So I actually contacted him and asked whether this article was true, and he said no. What this means is that newspapers or reporters selectively edit or distort or twist the content of the interview. This is very problematic. And there is much talk about whether nuclear po power can be a tool or a response in the face of climate change. Because this is a controversial issue, we should look into this topic from an analytic frame, but that is not really happening when you read Korean news articles. Based on each newspaper's ideological tendency, um, you see quite different tones. Most of the economic or conservative newspapers talk about how nuclear power can be a response to climate change, which is why I think we should take a closer look into these matters. And last, during last year's typhoon season, my sack and high somewhere the typhoons and six nuclear power plants stopped operation and conservative newspapers did not really cover this fact or they said that emergency diesel generations were enough to replace the nuclear power plants while progressive newspapers delivered and express their strong concerns about safety issues. So I think these are also issues that need more in-depth um, reports. And then there were much reports about landslides, and conservative newspapers dealt with landslides a great, to a great extent. Where, while progressive newspapers emphasized that landslides caused by PVs accounted for less than 1%. So climate change response should be a topic 
쉽게 심층적으로 고민해 볼수 있는 그런 기사를 제공해야 되는 것도 불구하고 objective information and facts should be delivered. Nevertheless, and unfortunately, even when it comes to photovoltaics, there is much twisted or even fake news articles, which is why many people want to do a cross-check about these articles. And regarding the Spiegel article, the Korean government even released a press release. The Korean Energy Information and Culture Agency also does fact-checking of news articles, and even within the press, they are also conducting cross-checks, and so are NGOs. So I think it is very problematic that there is a greater need to do fact-checking. Expression, freedom of expression and freedom of speech, Korea ranks very high. Recently, actually it is ranked number one in Asia when it comes to credibility of the media, uh, it ranks the lowest. So I think Korean news media should do some serious self-reflection and what to do with fake news. CO2 reduction is a very pending matter. Nevertheless, non-scientific news articles are being produced, which is ever delaying um, achievement of Korea's target goals. So again, we need to take a more serious look into the matter of fake news, and news media itself needs to reflect and make necessary adjustments. Thank you very much. Thank you, Professor uh, Yun. Uh, the uh, analysis of the uh, media uh, coverage was uh, very uh, informational, and I think I have to review my own uh, reports. And you have raised uh, very serious issues regarding uh, how the news media is covering these issues. So I think we can uh, talk about this uh, during the uh, panel discussion. Next, I'd like to uh, invite Professor uh, Pardo. Pardo. Thank you, and uh, thank you very much uh, for the invitation uh, to be today. Good afternoon uh, to everyone. Uh, uh, you should be able to see uh, my slides right now. My presentation, in a sense, is going to uh, complement uh, uh, Professor June's uh, presentation. I'm going to briefly go over the use climate change uh, policy uh, and a very important issue for the European Union, which is cooperation with Korea and other Asian countries. And then I'm going to discuss the role of the media in interrogating uh, both the use climate change policy, but also uh, in uh, promoting or uh, interrogating as well the relationship between Asian countries and the European Union uh, in this area. Because from a European perspective, there is this understanding that the only way to deal with climate change is through cooperation with other countries. And obviously, as the Asian economies continue to grow at a very high speed uh, following um, um, the COVID-19 crisis, uh, pandemic crisis, then uh, there's going to be more emissions coming from the Asian uh, continent. So I'm going to, as I said, briefly talk about the US climate change policy, which was uh, approved only uh, a, few, a few weeks ago, or outlined only a few weeks ago. Uh, then I'm going to focus on the cooperation with the uh, Asia and Korea component. And then I'll focus on the role of the media uh, in these two uh, areas. Uh, so let's begin with the US climate change uh, uh, policy. Uh, as you can see there, uh, the goals uh, and the priorities have only uh, been very recently uh, set up. Of course, there were previous policies uh, in years past, but now this has become an emergency. It has become an emergency because European citizens uh, demand action on climate change and politicians have to listen uh, to the citizens, have to listen to their uh, voters. So the Council and the European uh, Parliament uh, set up uh, this strategy uh, a few weeks ago with the objective of climate neutrality by 2050, uh, which matches the objectives set up by other countries, including, for example, in an Asian context, Korea, Japan, and uh, China. But there is also an interim goal by 2030 of collective uh, net greenhouse gas emissions 
to be reduced by at least 55% compared to 1990 uh, by, by 2030, so in less uh, than, than a decade. And I'll get back to this point uh, later on because there is a point in which I think the role of the media is particularly uh, important. Uh, the priorities, if you look at them, there's this focus on emissions reductions as opposed to removals. So the idea that we have to make more use of renewable energies, that we have to reduce, for example, in the manufacturing process, uh, the emissions, and not so much focusing on, on removals, for example, uh, using uh, the technologies for uh, carbon uh, capture, or, for example, reforestation. The focus is on the reduction, per se, and obviously uh, businesses, governments, not only citizens, have a very important role to play uh, in this particular area. I'll get back to this point later on as well. There's also going to be an Europe a European Scientific Advisory Board on Climate Change that is going to be uh, set up, because the idea is for this climate change policy to be uh, science-driven. Right, that there is this perception, and in the past, maybe political goals and business interests were more important when it came to climate change than the, than the scientific consensus, which is the climate change uh, to a large extent is human made. So, there is going to be this scientific advisory board on climate change uh, made up of um, scientists from all across the European Union, uh, advisors as well from across the European Union, the potential from, for advisors also coming from outside of the European continent, uh, contributing to the discussion and the policy about climate change in the European Union. And there's also the Commission is also going to um, set an intermediate target for 2040 that should lead to carbon neutrality by 2050. Uh, this agreement is subject to approval. Uh, and here again, the role of the media is going to be quite important because the hope is that the agreement uh, is going to be approved in its current form. Uh, it is very ambitious uh, and uh, it's also science driven, uh, but this should happen uh, in the coming uh, weeks or months. And then it should be enshrined in law. And this is important because once uh, it is enshrined in law, this means that uh, potentially uh, any European citizen, any European entity, uh, or even any uh, European government uh, could actually ask uh, the different uh, uh, actors who are involved in the implementation of this policy uh, to actually do so, or they can be taken to court. So this is quite uh, relevant. Now, from a European perspective, when it comes to climate change, uh, it is uh, not enough for uh, the European Union per se and European Union member states, European countries, uh, to try to reach carbon neutrality by 2050. There has to be a global effort. And of course, in this global effort, you have to involve the US, you have to involve uh, other countries uh, in uh, Asia as well. So the uh, European Commission actually has agreements with China, India, Japan, and Korea, a specific on climate change, as well as uh, the regional organization of ASEAN in Southeast Asia and the Asia uh, Europe meeting. Now, uh, this matters for the European Union, A, because this shows that, um, the, the, that there is a focus on cooperation with the four biggest economy in uh, Asia and the four economies uh, in the region that are or are going to become the largest emitters of uh, uh, greenhouse, greenhouse gases, right? So there needs to be an agreement, there needs to be this dialogue, and I emphasize the word dialogue uh, with these countries because in the past the European Union maybe took the approach not of dialogue but of telling these countries what to do. And this has changed, now there is a dialogue process. If you look at the cooperation areas, this is very comprehensive, uh, and I'll get back to this later on when I discuss the role of the media. But you see how there is focus on dialogue and, 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 and development, sharing expertise, again, the, the importance of sharing, of dialogue with the counterpart, not the European Union telling Asian countries what they should be doing. There's also the emphasis on financing, so the idea that if we're going to uh, reach uh, uh, carbon neutrality, if we're going to offset uh, and be able to deal with climate change. We have to involve developing countries as well, but these developing countries need to receive financing from international institutions, from the European Union, but also from Asian institutions and Asian countries. There's a focus on sustainable development uh, cooperation, so the importance of sustainability, uh, technology transfer to uh, developing countries, and research collaboration not only between the EU and Asian countries, but also with developing countries, and also making a sustainable development part of the trade policy of the European Union. So, for example, if you look at the EU-Korea FDA, uh, there is a chapter on the uh, sustainable development. 
And if you look at the EU-Japan FTA, which is more recent, there is a commitment by both parties to abide by the cl Paris Climate Change Agreement, right? So it's a binding commitment uh, in the case of Japan, in the case of Korea, with the FTA that uh, was uh, entering into force a bit earlier, uh, there is a chapter on sustainable development. So this cooperation with Asian countries uh, matter. Now, what is the role of the media? in uh, these two areas. First of all, when it comes to uh, EU policy, that, that, that's a nice picture when we could have uh, press conferences in person. Hopefully, we'll resume those type of press conferences uh, soon. So first of all, uh, awareness raising and information dissemination. We have heard during the introduction to today's seminar uh, that uh, the uh, European uh, media and Brussels-based uh, media uh, are actually increasing the coverage of climate change issues, are also issuing reports about best practices. This is uh, very welcome. I have to say that, uh, at least on the European side, when it comes to information dissemination, I think that the situation has improved uh, compared to the past. Uh, clearly, there, is, uh, there are many more uh, articles uh, dealing with this issue, uh, many more op-eds dealing with this issue as well. So the uh, pages, for example, of newspapers, uh, websites being open to those with expertise uh, uh, in, 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 in this area. And uh, if you look at uh, polls being conducted in the, uh, across the European Union, across the different European countries, you see how more and more people have an interest on uh, climate, change, uh, climate change issues. Uh, I think this is only going to increase uh, after the uh, pandemic is uh, uh, finally over because people have realized how uh, they can be affected by uh, natural phenomena, right? So this role is quite important. And as I said, I think the, the role of the European media has uh, improved in this sense, but obviously there's always more than can be done. Also policy interrogation. This is not the first EU policy on climate change. So if we have new policies, this is because the previous ones haven't been working. There is this belief that previous policies haven't worked, therefore we need a new policy. Now we're talking about reaching carbon neutrality in 2050. And this is great, but this is almost 30 years away, right? So politicians from today can make commitments that they know they won't have to be uh, uh, implementing uh, because it will uh, be up to politicians of the future to do this. So what happens if in 10 years' time we have new politicians uh, come to power and they say, well, instead of um, carbon quality by 2050, we're going to push it back to 2060, to 2075, and we keep pushing this back. This has happened in the past, as we all know, and we only need to look at the provisions, for example, of the Kyoto Protocol in the 1990s and how they had to be updated later on with, for example, Paris Climate Change uh, Agreement because they were not being made. So I think this is important. And also, if the European Union is focusing on reduction as opposed to removal, what actors are going to be involved in this reduction? It has to be businesses, it has to be consumers, uh, it has to be distributors, supermarkets, for example, it has to be uh, governments as well. So it has to be, this has to be interrogated that we're really focusing on reduction because removal, there seems to be a scientific consensus that this is a second best option, that reduction should be uh, the priority, uh, which takes us to my next point. Institutions have to be held accountable. Firms have to be held accountable when they don't reach uh, their commitments. I think there has been an interesting trend is in that you see, for example, investors holding CEOs, holding firms more and more accountable if they don't have, for example, plans to offset uh, carbon emissions. Right? Journalists have to uh, be doing the same. They are actually doing the same. And this is actually uh, uh, quite important, the, the issue of accountability, because this will also bring credibility uh, to the policies being implemented by policymakers. But, but finally, I think there needs to be an avoidance of climate alarmism and, uh, and so-called apocalypse uh, uh, fatigue. Uh, I mean, you, you also look at uh, um, uh, polls conducted of uh, uh, European citizens. Uh, what do they think about uh, climate change? It is true that there is a, a rising awareness, raising interest uh, on, on this issue, but it's also true that uh, if we look at the more uh, alarmist, um, uh, for example, reporting, this puts people off. I think the importance of having a science-driven reporting, which I think uh, many media are doing, but as the previous presenter, Professor June, uh, mentioned, for example, we also have uh, fake news, and fake news can go in both directions, so that then those that deny climate change and those that actually uh, believe in doom and gloom, right? This can actually uh, 
lead to behavior by citizens in not believing that climate change is such a, a risk. Uh, taking the example of the uh, pandemic, you have seen how, for example, the consumption of news related to COVID-19 has dramatically re uh, decreased uh, in recent weeks. And to an extent, this, is, this seems to be because people uh, believe that there is uh, an ongoing alarmism about COVID-19 that is not warranted. I'm not saying this is the case, but this is the belief from many European citizens. And this could happen with climate change as well. What about the role of the media when it comes to cooperation with Asia or with Korea specifically? Uh, I've been working in this field for, for uh, some 15, 20 uh, years now. Uh, uh, cooperation between the EU and Korea and cooperation between the EU and other Asian countries. I have to say that reporting on this side, on both sides, on the European side and on the Korean side, has increased very clearly over the past five to ten years when the EU-Korea FTA was signed and the strategic partnership was signed as well in 2010-2011. So what you have seen is a growing awareness to an extent thanks to the role of the media. But it is true that on specific issues, the awareness might not be there, and one of them is actually uh, climate change. Of course, we all know that the space is limited uh, in uh, newscasts, uh, in newspapers, radio programs, uh, uh, even in the internet, right? Because you actually need people to write the articles. So uh, this might not be uh, um, uh, the top priority, but it is true that there could be, for example, more reporting on the annual EU. Uh, Korea climate change uh, dialogue because the decisions that are taken in this dialogue in theory should guide the policy that both the EU and Korea should be pursuing when it comes to cooperation in dealing uh, with climate change. There's also dialogue, for example, on uh, green growth. Uh, later this year, for example, there's going to be a dialogue on transport. So are the EU and Korea going to cooperate on sustainable transportation systems, right? For example, building sustainable airports, railroads, etc., etc., the use of electric uh, vehicles, these type of things. So I think there could be more reporting as an entry point for those who have an interest in this area uh, to actually get uh, more information about it. I think there is a need to promote mutual understanding. Uh, in, in, in the sense that in the case of the EU and Korea, of course, both of them are developed economies, both of them have similar, targeted, uh, similar targets. Uh, in, uh, but, but if you look at uh, other countries with which the EU is cooperating in this area, India and China, for example, they are still developing emerging economies, right? Uh, and, and sometimes you hear criticism from the Chinese side, from the Indian side, well, Europeans don't understand that we're still developing. So some of the measures that the EU might be implemented might not work for our country. Uh, is this true or not? Uh, that's for up, up to the media to interrogate. But I think there needs to be an understanding uh, to, to the different ways in which different types of countries uh, can move towards uh, climate change. I should say, actually, that this is more of an issue with, uh, with India, for example, than, 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 than with China. Uh, which takes me to my last point. I already referred to this. Both sides have to uh, be held accountable. So if the EU and Korea, for example, hold a dialogue uh, and, and, and they commit uh, to promote the use of uh, green uh, technologies, for example, are they actually doing this? I have to say on the European side, you see much more interrogation and push for accountability of policymakers, firms outside of the European Union not only in Asia, uh, also in the US, uh, also in other parts of the world, right? Uh, on the Korean side, I think this trend is actually emerging, but it focuses more on holding accountable Korean firms operating overseas. But maybe the Korean media could also move towards trying to see whether the European Union is actually keeping with its commitments, whether the United States is keeping with its commitments as well. This is not only about EU-Korea or EU-Asia uh, relations. So my time is over. Uh, thank you very much, uh, and I look forward to the comments from my fellow panelists and the Q&A. Thank you. Thank you very much for your insightful presentation. You talked about the targets of EU's climate um, policies. 
Can you emphasize the importance of collaboration and the importance of the role of the media? With this, we would like to conclude the two presentations, and we would like to now move on to the panel discussions. We have a total of six speakers as panelists. We will listen to their remarks one by one, after which we will have a question and answer session. I will give five minutes to each, each panel list. Please keep to your time limit. First, journalist Yoon ji of Sege Ilbo. Hello, I am Yoon ji of Sege Ilbo, or Sege Daily Newspapers. In the early 2010, I studied meteorology, and I started writing about climate ever since 2017 as a journalist. During that short period of time, I feel much change is occurring. As the two professors mentioned, there is much articles being written on climate change in Korean media. What I want to talk about today is whether such whether such quantitative uh, soar led to qualitative improvement, and I don't think that is actually the case. As Professor Yoon pointed out, there are many problems behind climate change coverage, and I would like to talk about why that is the case. First of all, I categorized climate change related articles. So, first of all, why is climate change happening? Why is the temperature rising? has to do with the science part of climate change. And then there is the policy part of climate change that has to do with emissions reduction efforts. So, so far, although Korea did not deal with climate change to a great extent, I think when it comes to scientific factual articles, I think the quality was quite good. But when it comes to policy-related articles, I think we still have much room for improvement. I say so because from a scientific point of view, climate change-related articles are written by journalists that work under the what we call the news speed system. They cover news at the Ministry of Environment and so on and so forth. But when it comes to policy issues, um, topics become very comprehensive. Certain um, declarations by Chongwade can be covered by the Chongwade reporters and so forth. But the new speed system creates many limitations when it comes to news coverage. For example, a political journalists often focus on political um, perspectives, and business journalists often would focus on corporate ESG management, and redevelopment or infrastructure has a direct um, impact on environment. Nevertheless, oftentimes many reports talk about uh, its relation with real estate fluctuations. Another point that I want to make has to do with nuclear power plants. In order for in-depth coverage to be made possible on nuclear power plants, we need to go through a scientific um, verification process, but that is easier said than done. And the reason I say so is because nuclear power, when it comes to nuclear power plants, the issue of safety and nuclear fuel uh, and frequency control are, can be subtopics. But many may not agree. Bill Gates recently talked about a progressive centrifuge and the issue of frequency control. Well, 
Many people say that we can, we have that taken care of. And then there is a term that is often used called nuclear integrative electricity production. So all of these terms are very technical, and it is not easy to even deliver what these concepts exactly mean to the average reader. And another point that I want to make has to do with, well, even if, even if we overcome the issue of readability, there is the issue of how many readers would actually read the articles written. Page views are often linked to a new media company's profit, which is why even if there is a high-quality article written, the company itself may not um, highlight that particular article. So, in summary, quantitative increase definitely happened, but improvement of quality and climate change-related article is, is not happening. Thank you very much. You talked, uh, dealt with the fundamental structure and the structural problems of Korean media. Next, I'd like to uh, hand the floor to environmental journalist uh, Frank Strava. Good morning to you all. Good afternoon. Uh, my name is Frank Strava. I work as a climate journalist for the Dutch daily newspaper called Trau. This is uh, today's edition. Uh, I won't be sharing any slides, so you will just see me in this presentation. Um, thanks a lot for inviting me to speak at this forum because I think this is a very important topic to speak about uh, the way that uh, journalists and media are coupling, covering the climate crisis and all the climate problems that the world is facing if the world is not succeeding with the Paris targets. And we are at this point already seeing a lot of effects in small island states and uh, uh, big parts of the world. So this is a really urgent matter. matter. Um, well, I'm glad that I can share some insights with you uh, about how, how we see this uh, challenge at my newspaper, how we can cover uh, the climate problem in such a way that, that it uh, gives an honest as well as an, a balanced uh, view to our readers. Uh, this is something that we try to deal with every day. Um, uh, how can we uh, write about climate uh, and uh, take all the, the, the urgent and alarming uh, reports that we see coming uh, uh, in a seriously, but also keep eye on all the innovations and solutions and the, 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 the points of hope that we also see coming from uh, people, governments, and also uh, companies that are leading the way to a, to a cleaner and more sustainable world. I think this, this balance is, is our main challenge uh, as, as media. Um, uh, how can we keep an eye for both sides? Well, we try to do that at the newspaper where I work. Um, uh, you could say we have a, a big tradition in covering climate news. Uh, as the first newspaper in the Netherlands, we started a separate news desk with five uh, full-time journalists that only are covering like the, pre the green items. Uh, so that includes climate, but also includes uh, circularity, uh, animal welfare, um, uh, clean water, clean air, all the environmental issues. Um, so we have a, a daily spread in our newspaper with only environmental uh, topics. So it's re it, it really one of our main uh, uh, main topics uh, every day. Um, and also we try to, to uh, make clear to our readers that all those topics are uh, connected. They are in interlinking. Um, to give an example, um, uh, if, we, if we succeed and uh, limit the, the warming of, 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 of uh, the earth, it could be that we are saving a lot of species, animal species, that are threatened by warmer water or warmer air. So there's a lot of interaction between those topics, and we make we try to make clear to also 
uh, underline that uh, climate change is really a broad issue which which if can affect everyone in their daily life so how, how do we try to do that um, well besides the daily spread that we print we also try to uh, make sustainability and environmental issues part of um, all covering uh, uh, so uh, if we if we write about sports it can be that, that we are publishing an article about how a football club can uh, become sustainable and how they can uh, find solutions uh, to, to work in a clean way. Or if we uh, publish about art, we can um, um, uh, underline how artists, painters or sculptors, they are also sending a message to the world uh, in a creative way um, uh, that we are not on a sustainable track yet and that action is needed. So, um, as, a, as, a, as a special uh, project, we also joined Estrau together with a, a, a weekly paper, uh, the Covering Climate Now International uh, Collaboration. So that's that's really a, a, a big project in which a lot of newspapers, but also radio stations and media, uh, TV media, joined together to give um, really explicit attention to climate. Um, so uh, for covering climate now, we printed a series of articles where we went into the Netherlands and uh, checked out places where climate is already already um, uh, giving problems. So uh, with, with, with more warming uh, situations, uh, heat um, in the cities, um, animals uh, trying to uh, trying to survive in, in more difficult circumstances uh, and the, the funny aspect in this project of climate covering climate now uh, we as journalists tried to travel uh, in a sustainable way for ourselves so a colleague of mine he went by electric car and uh, me myself I went to my uh, appointment uh, on running shoes uh, and all the, uh, the, 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 the CO2 uh, that we did um, emit, we, uh, we, um, we uh, covered by planting trees. So uh, we, we really try to make this a CO2 a neutral project as a, as a media uh, covering. So what else do we do? We have a, a special column, it's called the Green Guides because we see that a lot of our readers are really involved and um, uh, also curious about the climate issue. How can I make my own home more sustainable? How can I make it climate proof? Uh, how can I uh, be more eco-friendly on my office and my work? Uh, so this is really, uh, really basic questions there that our readers are dealing with and they are sending us emails and letters uh, addressing these topics. So we try to provide uh, answers, or, uh, even if the, there are small steps, what people can do themselves. Um, uh, it's, it's something that we notice at our opinion desk, where readers are mailing to, that are, that are uh, a, a lot of questions about this. So the involvement is super big. Uh, another, another column that we have is called the Green Plane. Uh, you could say that this is like a fact check. Uh, a lot of companies are claiming that they are doing super well for the planet, that they are uh, eco-friendly, they are climate neutral and so on. Uh, we are uh, checking if these claims are true or not, because there's also a lot of window dressing going on when companies say that they are doing uh, super well for the planet and under, underneath there's, there's still a lot of damage. So that's that's also a way that we try to uh, really stay focused on this topic of climate change. Uh, then we have a yearly special project uh, that's called uh, the Duurzame Honda. That's really one of our main uh, brands, so to say. Uh, the Duurzame Honda you could translate as the Sustainable Hundred. Uh, this is a list, a ranking of people, projects, companies that are doing. Um, uh, uh, good things for planet environment uh, and they are really the, the, the front line of, 
of the solution, so to speak. So this is our way to do uh, a bit of constructive journalism. Uh, let's let's show where the solutions are, how people are involved, how people want to change, and 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 um, who the front runners are. So uh, last year, we had this uh, this this as the the winner. That was the youth mo movement. That was really uh, connected to, to to the whole Greta Thunberg movement. Um, uh, that is our way to show that that there's also solutions coming up, and there are light points next to all the problems. Because I, uh, uh, let me say again, that's what I think is the main um, issue for us as media. Let's focus on all the problems and take that seriously, but also let's keep an open eye to the solutions that are still coming and in progress. Thank you. Thank you very much. You talked about how your country covers the topic of climate change. Next, we would like to invite Deputy Director Lee Sangbom of KBS. Hello, everyone. I am Deputy Director at KBS, and my name is Lee Sangbom. I am producer of the Environment Special Program, and the Environment Special Program has been revived and every evening at 8 p.m. on Thursday this program is being aired. Sustainability, clean water, clean air and efforts to preserve environment is something that I'm very interested in and I give much thought to what the role of the media should be. So I very much agree to the previous panelists' comments. And and Yoon ji talked about quantitative increase but lack of quality articles, and I believe that we at KBS should do the same. The environment special is dealing with global crises, drought, flooding, wildfires, natural disasters, COVID-19. These are all posing risks to the global community, which is why we need to take a closer look into environmental issues and also um, do some serious self-reflection. So based on two major mottos, we are making our productions. First, from the perspective of nature, and second, from the perspective of future generations. We think that humans are not the only owners of planet. Plants, fish, and the entire ecosystems are also owners of the planet. So we deal with a variety of topics from heat waves to COVID-19 to potential future environmental risks. And our program features and is aired for 16 minutes. Kim Hyojin, actress Kim Hyojin, is serving as the moderator. And um, the first production was aired on early March. We talked about the Fukushima incident and related sewage. And we have also dealt with the topic. Well, this week we will be dealing with global warming and coastal pollution and look at what's happening to anchovies. Snow leopard is also um, an animal that is on the verge of extinction, which is why we dealt with that as well. 
And then we also did a program that had to do with an animal called purpoise and how their lives are linked to coastal pollution and plastic pollution. So we are again dealing with a variety of environmental issues and we are doing in depth coverage of these micro topics. Oftentimes, climate change seems too large for us to approach. So I think programs need to be effective in their delivery and interesting in their content. So under environment special, we come up with in-depth analysis, creative delivery, and new HD um, footages. In order to deal with climate change issues, um, expertise and credibility needs to be secured, which is why KBS is working hard to deliver what is happening to the environment to, and also communicate the value of Mother Nature. And we also want to deliver the message that we have to act be before it is too late. We also invite environmental experts to our programs. So we basically talk about how important environmental issues are and how pertinent the issue is to our daily lives. And taking a step forward, we are planning to air a program starting this July called Major Transition. And it is a program that will talk about the status quo of the environment and the future of the environment. It, it is divided into eight parts. Uh, it has 100% persons reading component. It talks about the green generation and food shortage issues. So it, it, it is ba basically providing an opportunity to talk about what we should do to respond to and overcome environment-related issues. Thanks to fossil fuels, um, Western civilization has spread. But in the face of climate change, a paradigm shift is in order. So we want to look back on fossil, the fossil fuel culture of the past, and we want to seek an alternative system for the future. So the major transition program will diagnose the fossil fuel-based culture and what kind of paradigm shift can be possible, abnormal weather patterns, natural disasters, the spread of diseases, and risks posed on productivity and labor. All of these issues will depend on how well we overcome environmental problems. Therefore, the media should continue to publicize related topics. So KBS is taking a lead. We'll continue to take a lead in publicizing environmental issues and by jointly working with international media companies, it will further expand its territory. Last but not least, two years ago, the World Scientists Association released a climate change guideline. Yes. The guideline talks about carbonless economy, transition to a carbonless economy. And it talks about stabilizing global population. 
So the association provided such guidelines, and KBS will do its best to abide by them. Thank you very much. So uh, based on a survey, uh, the public uh, seems to uh, see the uh, urgency, but uh, don't feel that it's uh, their own problems in their everyday lives. So I. I uh, believe that uh, we can uh, talk about how we can uh, solve this uh, problem based on your experiences. And next, I'd like to uh, invite Clive Tiemann. I have a presentation that I have prepared so we can look at that as well whilst I talk. And um, so. Uh, I'm not just a journalist, I'm also a scientist. So uh, I've been working with climate change since uh, more than a decade, and I have a degree in environmental science. I uh, have also worked with uh, climate activists. I put uh, a show on, on the UN building with a charity I founded called Project Pressure, where we put voices for the future. So the voices of six activists from uh, each of the world populated, uh, populated continents. I want to talk to you about uh, not about all these general stories that we hear and all the climate reporting that we do, like forest fires, glaciers, floodings, and scientific reports, because we've heard those stories before, and it's old news. I want to talk to you about what I think is the real story and what is the most important story at the moment, and I will summarize it like this. But first, before we start with takeoff, we can start with uh, a word that originates uh, from Denmark, from not from Denmark, from Scandinavia, which is flugskam, which is flight chain. It was uh, kind of uh, came into the vocabulary a few years ago. And what was interesting about this is that it encapsulated and it kind of caught the movement. People wanted to do something. They wanted to be active. So the best thing an individual can do is stop flying. Now, the problem with this is that flying is less than 2% of carbon emissions. If everybody in the world stopped flying, it wouldn't matter from a carbon budget point of view. So flight shame uh, kind of side railed a little bit the conversation, I think. What I want to talk about is that in, so in Scandinavian media, for sure, there's been a very big focus on individual responsibility and what the individual actions can be. The problem with that narrative is that it takes away from the bigger picture. Uh, there's, uh, there's research that shows that if we have incremental changes and it might feel good, it actually doesn't, it, it takes the focus away from the bigger picture. So publishing story about what the individuals should do is just uh, the wrong way around it. And it also takes the focus away and the responsibility from the fossil fuel complex because that's the responsibility and that's what we need to be focusing on. There's about 100 companies that are responsible for 71% of carbon emissions. Those are the ones that we should talk about. So if we look at the history of uh, how climate change has been uh, covered to some extent, then stage one, I would say, is denying. Science was discredited. There was an outright denying of uh, climate change. So we were discussing uh, is climate change real? And we were discussing that for ages. The media absolutely failed massively on a global scale because the media thought that it was a 50-50. We should give equal voice to both sides. Well, the problem was that it was a minute, minute minority that were deniers, but they were given equal voice by the media. So the public thought that climate uh, denying was actually something they should consider when it's uh, just like the denying climate change is the same as the Earth is flat or that gravity doesn't exist, it does. Stage two in this uh, uh, kind of, I would say my narrative, is the individual focus. It has allowed the uh, big polluters, uh, I'm talking about CO2 polluters, uh, greenhouse gas polluters, to shift the responsibility and the focus away. And by doing so, it becomes a um, kind of topic where people discuss, should I be flying or should I not be flying? And there's a lot of infighting. It's problematic. Now, we're set up for stage three in this process of, uh, let's say, the denying sphere, where 
the net zero, the net zero, 2050 net zero, and why that is a trap. Well, for a number of reasons, uh, net, net zero is not true zero. Net zero means that we supposedly capture or offset huge amounts of CO2. Well, that's just kicking the can down the road. It doesn't solve the problems, but it allows a false narrative. The, if we look at the scientific consensus and to stick within something like the Paris Agreement, the scientific consensus is that the emissions needs to drop now, like yesterday, and this, the curve needs to be very sharp. So 2050 is a, a net zero, is a, it's a false narrative. The idea that we can like burn now and pay later just sees that the emissions continue to soar. I mean, in theory, it's a good idea that we could do this, but in reality is that it just helps maintain this belief that we can just do business as usual, maybe make some small incremental changes. And then at some point, technology will save us with some like carbon capture technology or something else that has not been proven and has not been scaled yet. The only way around this is to truly cut emissions. Then the problem with the net zero uh, narrative is that the sense of urgency about doing the real solutions is failed. We think we have time. We don't have time. And that's the problem. So I really think that we should talk about uh, look at things in a prism of not allowing this false narrative to take place because if we do that we'll just do the media will but just be stage three of another failure first we gave the deniers all the voices then we shift responsibility to the individual and if we fall into the 2050 net zero trap we'll be at a point where catastrophe has happened and we we allowed it on our watch so delaying action so far has just been a catastrophe and delaying uh, action more will just amplify the disaster. And those that champion net zero as a kind of breakaway uh, thought and, and can do something for, for, uh, for climate change, those are, those, are, those are the new deniers. And I think that's the most important uh, story. And I think the media's role is to call it out don't accept it. Don't let this narrative. When you, when we get these manifestos from companies and stuff that says, "Yeah, we'll be we'll be clean by 2050," if you read them in detail, a lot of them has developing technologies. It means that they don't know what they're doing, and that's the problem here. So, first of all, call out this would be my one thing: is the role of the media. Don't let us fall into yet another trap of being uh, part of this problem. Secondly, we should. Uh, stop giving voices to uh, the new deniers. And then for sure the media should stop taking money from anyone within the fossil fuel complex and ban all advertising. That's, uh, those are my recommendations. And that was uh, hopefully only five minutes. Thank you. Thank you very much. Because, yes, the you talked about the importance of objective reporting. Next, I would like to invite Eugene Anagwe of Kenya, CEO of KM Look Up Media. So we please share your slides with us as well. Thank you very much. Right. Um, I hope it, uh, you, everything is visible. My name is Eugene Anangwe. I am the CEO of KM Lookup uh, Media, and I've spent uh, 15 years of my life uh, within the media sphere, and I take pride in uh, setting up uh, startup media houses, uh, and of course, I'm also an Afro uh, optimist. Uh, today, I'm going to be talking about uh, the Kenyan story, and of course, uh, for those who have seen or have been in Kenya, you understand that uh, this country is uh, pretty much uh, like an artistic collection of different kinds of ecosystems and territory with uh, so many people from diverse cultures. And of course, uh, the topography and uh, the country is uh, just an amazing one. And our economy is largely dependent on tourism 
and rain-fed agriculture, both uh, are susceptible uh, to climate change and extreme weather events. Now, in Kenya's case, climate change has led to more frequent extreme weather events, and we've seen a lot of drought conditions, uh, which have lasted longer than usual. We are also currently seeing irregular and unpredicted uh, rainfall, uh, which is causing uh, a lot of flooding and increasing of uh, temperature every now and then. And environmental issues in Kenya include uh, deforestation, uh, soil erosion, uh, desertification. Uh, we've seen also water shortage and uh, degraded water quality, plus flooding, poaching, and domestic and industrial uh, pollution. Now, if you uh, have a look at uh, this, you'll be able to see the state of affairs. These are pictures, uh, real events that have taken place over the last few months. Uh, we've been able to see, um, uh, you know, uh, crocodile infested lakes and rivers busting their banks. And we've seen crocodiles, uh, you know, uh, finding themselves within the ecosystem that humans are in. We've also seen uh, the famous black tea of Kenya uh, being under threat from climate change. And we've been able to see uh, from reports that uh, the uh, conditions of growing this tea will be reduced by a quarter. Uh, which is 26.2% by 2050. And we understand that tea plays a major role in our foreign exchange. Uh, Kenya's most uh, optimal uh, tea growing areas, such as Mount Elgon and Mbere in central Kenya, are the areas which will be highly um, affected. Uh, we also understand that the country will be under extreme rainfall events, and we've seen the Rift Valley region uh, being heavily affected. Livelihoods have changed. And we have farmers who now are not sure when uh, to start planting and when uh, to not to actually do that. Now, sadly, we have seen loss of lives. Uh, currently, more than 237 Kenyans have died um, uh, due to causes of flooding. And over 161,000 have been rendered homeless uh, due to um, you know, climate change related effects. But the beauty is that there's a lot that is being done behind the scenes. And we've been, been able to see in March 2013, uh, Kenya did launch what is called the National Climate Change Action Plan. And this plan was developed from 20 months of clear analysis and consultations. And uh, it does address the options for a low carbon climate resilient development pathway. And it does mitigate uh, growth uh, or growing emissions of carbon. Uh, the plan also addresses the enabling aspects uh, of finance, policy, and legislation, knowledge man management, among other issues. Uh, we've also seen uh, some close ties between Kenya and the United States. And of course, the partnership between these two countries on climate issues is seen as a point of hope for Kenyans as far as cushioning uh, them from uh, the impact of climate change uh, is concerned. Uh, the president of Kenya and, uh, uh, you know, the U.S. president uh, recently had a call on the same uh, to be able to see how Kenya can be supported in the areas of climate change. Our president here has actually uh, committed uh, to reduce greenhouse gas emissions by 32 percent by 2030, and there's a target of 100 percent clean cooking by 2028. And of course, uh, the question is whether this will be achieved or these are just uh, political rhetoric. Uh, as one speaker mentioned that politicians make commitments uh, that they are sure that they will not even be there to be able to um, uh, uh, you know, realize. Now, what is the role of the media um, in all this? I want to believe that by telling and highlighting the stories around climate change, the media does expose where the problems are and, of course, raises the red flag for concerned authorities uh, to act. However, um, I think there is also a need for media to move away from just reporting on what happened. And we should be able to start setting the agenda or play the agenda setting role uh, clearly. Because with social media today, on WhatsApp, you're able to know what has happened and so media should now be able to move the conversation to a more analytic and, of course, to analyze more on uh, why it happened, 
uh, how it will impact the public and why they must be part and parcel of the solution to more analytical aspect. And I think also media must play a key role um, in ensuring that we are not caught off guard. We are not just being a conveyor belt of information from people who have vested interests that are not interests uh, that concerns uh, the public. I also believe that uh, by partnering with concerned authorities in informing, uh, you know, around climate change issues, the media does help in awareness creation, but we should not just be, uh, uh, you know, sharing the doom and gloom uh, information as one speaker mentioned earlier on. I think it's time we also uh, celebrated the success stories and rewarded best practice by covering these stories, amplifying them. And we also need to make climate uh, and environment issues uh, more, uh, you know, um, interesting uh, because we have seen time and again climate issues, health issues, education, technology issues are considered as boring uh, conversations. We need to be creative enough as to how we can be able to make people more interested in climate related issues. Right now we are streaming live on YouTube and we only have three people who are actually watching us right now. We must be able to challenge ourselves. What would be the creative ways of ensuring that people are interested uh, in these issues? I think last but not least, we also need to make it deliberate in our newsrooms, in our programming, to be able to feature climate related uh, issues uh, so that it is not just um, uh, because there's an event that has happened, that's when we are covering this, but we must be deliberate and focus and say every Thursday or every Wednesday, we are actually covering a topic related to uh, climate change um, uh, issues. I wanna end it there, but I'll be here to be able to share more uh, during the conversations or question and answer sessions. Thank you so much for actually having me on this particular panel. So thank you very much. So the uh, news media has to go deeper, not just uh, delivering uh, the information to the public. And at the same time, uh, the uh, positive aspect of what's happening uh, should also be reported. Now, uh, I'd like to hand the floor to journalist uh, Berna Namta of Nation Media Group. Thank you so much. Sorry. Can you hear me now? Thank you so much uh, for, for this opportunity. It's an absolute uh, pleasure to be able to attend and join colleagues uh, around the world. And special thanks, especially to the Korean Press uh, Association for taking the lead on this. Um, allow me to begin by saying that um, listening to the presentations that have been made before, I feel that I have more learning to do than actually speaking. So I should perhaps spend more time uh, listening to all of you. And the reason I say this is uh, based on the first uh, presentation uh, by the professor. When I was preparing notes uh, for, for this presentation, I couldn't find a scientific study on what the Rwandan media has done so far around environmental journalism and climate change. So that's why I, I feel a bit uh, uneasy uh, with my presentation because uh, it's not based on empirical evidence. Uh, secondly, I would like to say that uh, again, listening to my colleagues, uh, especially the one from Netherlands, um, they are doing so well in terms of uh, setting the desks, uh, the environmental desks, uh, journalism desks in newsrooms and having specific topics. And I think it's a great learning that we should be doing, uh, replicating in different newsrooms uh, around uh, the world, uh, because currently in the new structure, Rarely do you see uh, environmental issues, climate change issues being given front page. Um, any journalist would understand the importance of uh, the front page, page one stories. So hopefully uh, we'll be able going forward to also set up uh, such a structure and then try to devote a lot of our coverage uh, to climate change and environmental issues 
Now, briefly, if I could talk about uh, what we are doing uh, as a media house and, and in Rwanda with regards to climate change and environmental issues. In Rwanda, we have an association of uh, science journalists, uh, which was founded in 2007. And this group of journalists, around 20 journalists, have been focusing on highlighting uh, environmental issues. But again, what we see is uh, the capacity is lacking. Uh, and again, this is because for the media to play its role, you need journalists that understand climate change. And this relates to the earlier presentation, uh, which spoke to how do you avoid raising unnecessary alarm? How do you stick to facts? And how do you hold politicians to account based on some of these declarations? And the reason I want to emphasize this is because we are seeing uh, increasingly climate change becoming like a buzzword or green growth. You know, politicians around the world keep talking about these things. And it is the role of the media to actually hold them to account to the statements they make. Going back to Rwanda, uh, in 2016, we have, we hosted uh, a big meeting around climate change and uh, Many of you may be aware of the Kigali amendment to the Montreal Protocol that was signed. Now, a few years down the road, since it came in, into effect in 2009, we haven't really seen a lot of coverage around the agreement. You know, so the meeting happened. The journalists said, you know, this uh, the, uh, groundbreaking agreement has been signed in Kigali. But since then, we haven't really seen a lot of coverage tracking progress with regards to implementation. And that is the role of the media. So do, and I feel that part of the challenge is that we don't really have the skills to first of all, understand the legal text of the agreement and be able to explain it to our audiences. So, and this is because for me, I feel that the role of the media should be to one, understand the science and make it relevant for ordinary people, including the peasants who may not be able to understand the buzzwords, who may not be in these um, fancy conference rooms where these discussions take place. But until we have a critical mass of journalists that really understand climate change as an issue, environmental issues, then we will still tell the story from the people in fancy offices, fancy conference rooms where these discussions happen. So in Rwanda and in our newsroom, what we're trying to achieve is to break down, stop using actually the buzzwords and explain to someone and say, there were landslides. We have lost, uh, for instance, uh, 300 people, but this is where the, how we ended up with landslides. And this is what needs to happen if the government really means it's going to protect its people from landslides. Secondly, we have been trying to, again, uh, explain some of government policies. Uh, for instance, Rwanda has been very active in terms of um, signing uh, climate change uh, agreements and making pledges. A few years ago, uh, I think, over 10 years ago, Rwanda banned plastic bags, the use of plastic bags. And it was among the first countries, uh, I think, uh, if not around uh, Africa, that banned the use of plastic bags. And it was a big milestone, it was talked about. But what we saw from the stories, uh, tracking progress again, my earlier point, we realized that a few years down the road, people started using plastic bags again. We had people smuggling these uh, plastic bags. And what we did as a newsroom was to highlight this and say, we made progress when we banned plastic bags, but from our own investigations, what we are seeing is that plastic bags are coming back to our streets. We have people that are using these plastic bags. And this is a story that we did. And uh, thankfully, the 
makers took action and uh, we even won an award for that. So in conclusion, really what I want us to, uh, uh, I feel the role of the media is one, break down the issues to the ordinary people to understand the impact. Climate change is not just about you know, temperatures rising, but someone to understand that if you're not, for instance, practicing uh, aware of conservation agriculture, eventually we'll have food insecurity. So in brief, uh, we don't have so much time, but just to say that the role of media has to focus on one, sticking to the facts, two, breaking down the big scientific messages for ordinary people to understand how climate change affects them. Thank you. 네, 감사합니다. 그럼 루안다에서에서 기후변화. Thank you very much for sharing the Rwanda's experience on climate change coverage. You talked about how the media outlets have to focus on sustainability. We will now listen to the presenters' answers and comments. In response to the panelists' remarks, I would like to ask each speaker to speak within five minutes. Thank you very much for your wonderful comments. And the person that presented after me talked about the need for cooperation between international media companies. I think that is a great idea. I think my suggestions and your comments overlap to a great deal. I do not like the idea of using a terror frame when covering climate issues because the general public will turn indifferent or walk away from that coverage. So it is very important to share success stories and create a positive frame for coverage. Not to say that we should be little climate change, but we have to deliver the message that there is hope. In order to deliver such a message, we need to share success stories of various countries, and we, share, we should share success stories of various communities and villages. And I think companies should also um, identify various best practices. So I think in this respect, I think international collaboration will be very useful, and we should report success stories of countries around the world, and we should also look into what conditions made such success stories possible. If we frame our coverage from that angle, then I think we can provide a positive tone to the readers. Uh, my master's and PhD degree was both on climate change, and during the past two decades, I am also engaging in environment-related civic activism. Based on what I have observed so far, I think what is important with environment is to have people recognize that it is a matter that concerns them. Of course, environment is an ethical issue as well, but they have to take it and absorb it as a very personal matter, something that affects their personal lives. So I think um, talking about job, linking environment with job or linking environment with health can be very effective. So I hope journalists can take more interest in how you can make that possible. In the Netherlands and in Denmark, you talked about the need for hope, and I agree to that. And the Korean panelists talked about scientific science-based article and media reporting. Where is my information source? When I asked that question to Korean journalists, many of them talk about how they need more credible sources. So for example, materials coming from IPCC or coming from major academic journals like The Nature or The Science. And 
In Korea, major uh, newspaper articles serve as important information sources. And a lot of journalists are contacting ex environment experts as well. So I think that journalists should um, kind of speed up in their efforts to do a better job of that. And there are uh, media companies that have expertise in environment. We used to have environment journalists as well in the past. Um, the number of them diminished currently, but Hangyore, Gyeongyang, and Herald Economy and NBC have a climate change team, coverage team. I don't think it's easy for an individual journalist to um, do things on their own. If you create an association of environmental journalists, then you can connect and link the association with environmental association. Our forum is running an academy where we invite journalists for lectures. At any rate, enhancing your expertise is very important, but oftentimes in Korea, the coverage culture is different, and enhancing expertise on environment is not easy given the Korean structure. So I think media companies should first have to recognize that the environment is not just a matter of covering articles under the environment section, because the environment um, affects the environment many and many other sectors of society. I learned a great deal through today's forum, and I will continue to conduct meaningful research. Thank you very much. Thank you, Professor uh, Pardo. Thank you, thank you very much uh, for, for, for all the comments. <laughs> I was taking many notes, actually. Uh, I'm, I'm going to focus on, 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 on four points, so I don't go beyond the, the five minutes. Or actually, three points uh, that were raised. Uh, first of all, I think it was uh, Mr. Eugene uh, Anangwe, uh, who, who raised the issue about covering success stories. Uh, and, 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 and Professor uh, Yun Sun Ching, uh, uh, Sun Nim, she also uh, discussed this, this message of, of hope, uh, as he put it. Uh, I, I think this is uh, important in the sense that, uh, as the professor said, Professor Yun said, uh, we, we run the risk of, of turning people off um, and important climate change uh, stories if we only focus on the, on the negative. Uh, I would like to draw the parallel with the COVID-19 uh, situation as well. Uh, you know, people want to hear uh, the success stories, for example, when it comes to uh, vaccinations that is going well in Europe, or the very low number of, of deaths uh, that you saw in, in, in Korea, of course, in, in, in other places of Asia as well, right? And I think that uh, prompts people to access a story and then move beyond uh, the headlines and the good stories, but also look at uh, the not so good stories. And I think when it comes to, to climate change, we can probably uh, see, that, see that happening uh, as, 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 as well. Uh, one thing that I find interesting when discussing these type of issues with, uh, with the students, with uh, young students, they are very aware of climate change, much more aware than previous generations, certainly than my generation when I was uh, growing up, there was coverage of climate change issues, but compared to what we see today, it's very different. So the level of understanding that young people, the, the leaders of the future have, uh, is, is higher in my view than we had in the, uh, in, 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 in the past. So I think it would be good for them not only to learn about uh, what they should be doing when they join companies, when they join governments, uh, to offset uh, the negative uh, aspects of uh, climate change and to prevent uh, climate change, uh, uh, but also, you know, what are the success stories in other places across the world from which they can uh, they can learn? Um, I, I I like the discussion about uh, from from uh, uh, Kim Se Hyun Kicha about uh, that people feel climate change is an emergency, but that it doesn't affect them uh, personally. Uh, and I think some of my uh, fellow panelists raised the raised the issue of uh, how, for example, we're seeing in 
uh, in uh, uh, Verna, for example, I think you mentioned this, how, how you try to link uh, natural disasters that might happen, you know, in a particular setting uh, to what is going on at the local uh, at the local level. This might be the way uh, uh, to go. I think this is uh, this is happening, but it might be the, the entry point. We all know, I mean, journalists uh, all know that uh, local news stories tend to draw the attention of most people uh, and, uh, and the central attention of most people, right? So I think that focusing on the local look, this is how you are going to be affected if we don't deal with uh, climate change at a personal level. Uh, it, it would be a very good way, I think, uh, to continue to raise awareness, but also maybe to try to uh, shift uh, the behavior of, of citizens, not only firms, but also citizens, so, so that they feel that they are part of the solution uh, to the problem of, of, of climate change. Uh, and I have to say, I think that uh, this may be an area that has been uh, less covered yet. Uh, so we see a lot of coverage, for example, when there is an environmental disaster, uh, of course, uh, when there is a climate change uh, meeting as well, for example, the United Nations level, what, what about the, the, the local? Uh, this might be a way to offset in this, uh, this point that was raised about people not feeling that this is affecting them uh, personally. Uh, and, and, and finally, I like the point uh, raised by uh, Yun Chiroki Cha about how to improve reporting of, of, of policy as opposed to the science of climate change, because at the end of the day, we're talking about politics, right? We're talking about political choices uh, being made uh, by governments. And you could argue when it comes to firms, there is also a political choice, not only an economic choice, when it comes to uh, coming up with ways to uh, deal uh, with, uh, with, with, with climate change. Uh, I think that, uh, uh, unfortunately, not only in Korea, but we see it across Europe as well, sometimes these issues are, are, are politicized, not the consensus about uh, climate change uh, uh, happening and, 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 and being uh, man-made, right? But, but, but address uh, climate change. And Professor Yoon, for example, show how uh, different aisles of the political divide have different approaches uh, to reporting climate change. And we can assume also have different approaches to how to deal with climate change and the debate about nuclear energy that some colleagues mentioned, fellow panelists mentioned, uh, uh, points in this, uh, in this direction. Uh, I think this is a very uh, difficult issue uh, uh, to address, but I think it might be possible uh, to uh, have journalists, uh, I was mentioned before, who are well trained on climate change issues, and we had a fellow, a couple of fellow panelists, uh, who had a back, who are journalists but had a background on environmental issues, right? And it, it, it might be an issue of promoting them. Perfect. Yeah, I will finish in, in 30 seconds. It might be an issue of <laughs> sorry about that. It might be an issue of really uh, bringing them. Uh, more into the uh, uh, into news media organizations and then being able to lead on this reporting because they knew the climate change issues inside out and they might come with a less uh, policy baggage than maybe other journalists might come from a political desk. Uh, and I will leave it there. Thank you very much again for, for the invitation. Thank you. You talked about how um, environmental issues will be here to stay. Thank you very much for your participation, and we would like to conclude today's Q&A session and the discussion session with this. Thank you very much.